would be most useful for you in our conversation today? Um, so I'm going to be taking my LSAT in June. And so far, I've sort of been doing a lot of like self prep. Uh, I haven't really, I heard a mixture of views about like Kaplan and stuff. So I was just wondering like what the benefits were to like a one on one sort of, I guess, program in preparing for the LSAT versus like these big classrooms where you come in with your books and depending on whether or not that's more effective, if you could speak to that at all. Yeah, sure. Well, first, let me ask you this. What do you feel is missing from your prep? Um, I mean, I would say it's just more monotonous of taking a bunch of different practice tests over and over again, um, sort of being able to put myself in the right mindset of actually walking in on test day because anybody can get you know, a 161 or a 171 on a practice test. So that ability of just walking in and knowing that I could do that when it actually matters, I think is something that I'm kind of lacking. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got a couple of things right there. So first off, taking exam after exam is exactly what you don't want to be doing. That's okay. a recipe for burnout and you're wasting valuable practice material. This relates to what I call the obsessive practice exam narrative. The idea that taking exam after exam after exam is going to lead to some miraculous breakthrough or some spotting of some hidden patterns, when in reality, you've got to slow down, take fewer exams, and review them in excruciating detail. The second okay. thing you mentioned about mindset, of course, a traditional in-person class is not going to be able to speak to your personal mindset because you're not having the chance to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. You might raise your hand in front of a room of people, except you don't because of fear of looking dumb, but you're also covering whatever the agenda is for that day which is typically, right. we have this syllabus, we have this curriculum, we have to go through these exact things, and maybe you're at one point, another person's at another point, and the instructor kind of has to cater towards the middle of the group. And the middle is typically getting people from the, the 140s to the 150s, or the low 150s to the high 150s, but typically not too much beyond that. And so if you're aiming for a top score, like 165, 170 plus, the class can't relate to that because by definition, it's got to cater to the majority of the people in the group or else they wouldn't really be serving the needs of the majority of students. Right. So one-on-one -on -one coaching can help you figure out what your blind spots are because you can't see your own blind spots. The other thing is that we could customize and tailor make a plan just for you based specifically on your areas of strength and weakness. And I love this coaching video project that I've been doing because I've had over a hundred video discussions just like this one. And that scales because although I'm not having all hundred people in a group at the same time, we're talking through those issues one-on-one, -on -one, whatever you need in the moment. And so let me ask you, Kyle, aside from what we've covered so far, what do you feel I could help you with right now? Um, I mean, I feel like the one subject that I'm pretty sure it's a kicker for a lot of kids is, um, or just test takers in general is on logical reasoning like mind games and the certain different types of just the ability to like read a question and then associate it with a specific type. Like reading comprehension, that never really phased me too much. I was always good at that. Um, but it's just a matter of you're on the clock and you got to understand like what game this applies to and have like a game plan going into that. So I think that's always something that when I time myself, I struggle with when it's sort of like sit back and take it at your own pace when it's in a book or something like that. I can get it, but it's just going to take a lot longer than the time would allow for. Yeah. I mean, the LSAT, a lot of it is pattern recognition. So we could speak a little bit about that. When it comes to games, you have ordering, grouping, combinations, rare types. And so you want to think, which of those major categories does a particular game fall within? What tasks are they asking you to do? Is it a sequence or a chronology of some kind? Or is it group one and group two? Or is it in and out? Then in logical reasoning, of course, you have question stem types like strength and weaken necessary assumption. And it's important to be able to properly distinguish between those. But then you also have methods of reasoning in the stimulus and patterns there. So you might have correlation causation issues or necessary and sufficient condition confusion or ad hominem personal attacks or absolute versus, pre num absolute versus relative percentages. So things like that, where there are methods of reasoning that you want to be proficient in so that when you come a new, across a new question on test day, even if the topic is different, 
you can relate it back to something you've seen before. So I wouldn't want you to only do questions by question stem type. There's also value in doing full sections and seeing the patterns and the mistakes you're making overall. Okay. What does your review so, process look like right now? Um, so typically I took my first diagnostic when you signed up with LSAC, you get that free account. Um, and right off the bat, I got a one, six, one, and I figured, oh, wow, it's a lot higher than I actually thought I would be to start. Um, and so that program usually has, I think I signed up for like every two or three weeks. Um, it's a main test, but it also takes like your strengths and weaknesses based on how you're doing from each. Um, and the reason I asked about logical reasoning is that seems to be like consistently like high on the priority stakes. Uh, and I do feel definitely a lot more confident in them compared to when I first began. Um, but it just seems to be something that at least timing wise, um, and like you said, recognizing the different patterns of questioning, um, that's going to take a bit more work with, but I've, I mean, the highest score I've gotten was a 170. Uh, the lowest was that 161 off the bat, but it's sort of been like peaks and valleys in between. Um, so it's just a matter of like finding the consistency to at least, you know, hit 170, maybe 172. Um, that's what I'm striving for with also these, um, you know, self-test prep books on the side. Right, right. Okay. Have you ever kept a mistake journal to really articulate your thought process for what you're getting wrong or having difficulty with? I have not. I noticed the common themes, but that's definitely something that I'll look into doing in the future. It's important. Yeah. Because just taking exams and looking at explanations, it's not forcing you to get into your own thought processes. It's really just giving you one person's way of approaching it but not every way works for every student, especially for games. There are a variety of valid ways to, to diagram and solve the questions. And so I would recommend always looking at multiple sources, but first reasoning through it yourself and seeing what your most efficient approach might be. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, and one thing that I did want to ask um, based on your experience with students is what's like one of the most common mistakes that potential test takers make, whether it's, I guess in prepping and then also on like the day of, if there seems to be like a different um, answer for both of those, or if it's the same, then that's fine too. But I wasn't sure if there was like a consistent thing you saw um, test takers walk into either prep. Yeah, I'll give you three of them. We've talked, touched on two already. The first one is what I call the obsessive practice exam narrative, taking exam after exam, measuring results, being happy or sad about them and moving on. And of course the problem there is that you're wasting valuable practice material and also wasting your time. The second one is failing to properly review to figure out where your misunderstanding stemmed from. Was it the question stem, the answer choices, or the stimulus? If it was the stimulus, what specifically made it difficult or tricky? If it was the question stem, what was that unfamiliar wording that gave you trouble? Oftentimes they'll take a common question type and misrepresent it in a variety of ways. And then the answer choices, what was tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it? or consider it, and what ultimately made it wrong, and what was discouraging about the right answer that pushed you away from it, and what ultimately made it correct. So you have those traps of discouragement towards the to away from the right answer, and traps of encouragement towards the wrong answer. Okay, I'm sorry, you just cut out a bit. Um, yeah, of course, no, I, I don't mind going through it. Yeah, of course, stuff. I don't mind going through it again, it's all right. So there are three particular common mistakes I noticed from students, and we've touched on two of them already. The first is that obsessive practice exam narrative, taking exam after exam, measuring your results, looking for hidden patterns, moving on to the next. The problem is that you're burning through valuable practice material and also wasting your time without building the foundation first and slowing down. The second one is failing to properly review. So I have what I call the Socratic review method. And in this method, what you're doing is you're figuring out where your misunderstanding stemmed from. Was it the stimulus, the question stem, or the choices. In the stimulus, if it was there, what was the method of reasoning? Did you thoroughly take the time to understand it? And what are the different ways that LSAC increased the difficulty level of the stimulus? For example, they might bury the conclusion in the middle. They might use a topic that nobody likes, like science or philosophy, or they might use those annoying words like unless, except, until, or without. So you gotta figure out what was ramping up the difficulty for you specifically. If it was the question stem, Sometimes they take common question stem types, but dress them up in unfamiliar ways with unfamiliar vocabulary or phrases. So you want to see if it was there or if it was in the choices. Specifically, 
what was tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong and what was discouraging about the right answer that pushes you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. So you have these traps of encouragement towards the wrong answer and traps of discouragement away from the right answer. So it's the second one, review. The third one is really just a mindset one, placing too much importance on any one particular LSAT administration. Because while the LSAT, while the LSAT as a whole is incredibly important, no one particular test date will make or break you. You can always retake. Law schools do not average multiple scores. They only take the highest. Right. Yeah, that's one thing um, just to follow up with is originally I was planning on doing um, the July test, but that was of the format that you wouldn't get the answers or the full test at all back once you finish compared to the one in June where once you submit it, you get a whole copy of sort of like your SATs, like you never see them again once you hand them in. That's what July is. The June one is you get all the right and the wrong, the good and the bad. And I think maybe just asking your opinion, I feel that the June one, you know, knock on wood, I don't have to take the LSAT again. It's a one and done. But in the instance that somehow I would, I wasn't you know, happy with my first try. Um, other than that, you don't see like there's any real difference between a June and a September test, just aside from that. Yeah, there's no difference. I mean, some tests are disclosed. Three right. per year are released where you get a full copy of the exam. The rest are all undisclosed. It doesn't really make a difference, but I could certainly see psychologically how it's nice to be able to see what you got right and what, got, what you got wrong. I wouldn't choose a particular test date for that reason alone, but okay. you know, we're speaking right now in February. If you feel like you could be ready by June, then yeah, go for June and then you get the exam back as a bonus. Okay. That sounds good. Well, I mean, I think that's all the major topics that I wanted to hit today. I do appreciate you taking the time. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties, but other than that, I found this very insightful. Um, you know, looked on to your show, your YouTube channel. I got a lot out of it. Looking forward to the uh, big talk tonight with Baylor. Yep. Yep. Well, Baylor. Yeah. Right. Awesome, Kyle. Well, I'm glad we connected. Uh, before we sign off, what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? Um, I'd say definitely that, not that I was doing everything wrong per se, but definitely just stepping back and going forward with test prep, like actually noting down what I got wrong, trying to learn from it instead of just beating into my head with repeated um, testing and actually just taking stock in what I'm doing. So, Awesome. Well, glad I could help. Please keep in yeah. touch. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.